So good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the uh, the beekeeping Zoom programs, the Tuesday Zooms. And again, our instructor for tonight is Scott Debnan from Montana and master beekeeper, master beekeeper instructor. So we're going to talk about Varroa and Varroa mite control and dealing with that pest. So with that, Scott, I am going to turn it over to you and it's your program. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all for coming. If you uh, weren't here last week, my name is Scott Debnam and I am a uh, online professor for both UMass Amherst and University of Montana. Uh, the University of Montana has a full-fledged beekeeping program, which I will be showing you all a couple of videos from that program in this lecture. Um, UMass has a single course beekeeping class. Either one, if you're interested in taking, can be found online. Uh, I will show you how to get to uh, the University of Montana beekeeping program. I believe that you have to be in the uh, sustainable agricultural program at UMass to take the course. I'm not real sure. Anyway, let's, um, we'll just go on with this thing. Today we're going to talk about varroa mites, uh, how to recognize them, how to monitor for them, how to treat for them. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, sharing my screen, and I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you a PowerPoint. Uh, feel free to photograph, screen capture, anything you want to do for that. Uh, for those uh, slides, I am not, you know, I'm not worried about. The information is free for you, so take advantage of it. And uh, Ms. Wisner is even recording this for prosperity, <laughs> so you can listen to it later in case um, you know, I go too fast. I get excited about talking about bees and I go pretty fast sometimes. So I'll try to keep that to a minimum. Also, if you look at the bottom of your screen, it said it has participants and it has a chat. If you click on participants, you'll, you'll be able to do a bunch of little things, raise your hand, you can mute other folks, you can mute yourself, all those things. If you click on the chat, you will be able to um, type a question. And so last time, most of the questions came through the chat. So let's use that for primarily for our questioning. All you have to do is you have a question as I'm going through the presentation, just type it in there. And I'll stop periodically and uh, read some of those questions and answer some of those questions, okay? And at the end of the whole thing, I will uh, try to capture all the questions and time that we have left, okay? Great, let's, uh, now I'm gonna go to screen share and you're about to see a power and we will get this thing kicked off. All right. Let me click it on me. Here we go. Oops. Start in the middle there. That's no good. Let's go back to the start. Whoa. Let's go. There we go. That's the start. That makes a little more sense. Okay. So this is a varroa mite. This is our enemy, <laughs> so to speak. It's an ectoparasite, which means it lives on the outside of the bee. Check it out. There they are on the outside of the bee. Let yeah, me highlight them here. There's one right here on her thorax. There's two right here, in fact, trying to squeeze in between her thorax and her abdomen. They love to live on this side right about here. That's their most popular choice of place to feed, okay? But this is what the varroa mite looks like. So get a search image in your mind of this little monster right here. This is the top and the bottom looks very similar. So you, just you can see the legs a little better, okay? All right, so we'll move on. Okay, now let's talk about the life cycle of varroa mite. Now, varroa mite lives its entire life cycle inside of uh, the bee's hive. Now, they can ride with the bee outside, and they do, and they can latch onto a bee if it's robbing a colony, and, and in that way spread to other colonies. So they spread very rapidly. It takes them a little less than four seconds to move from uh, the ground, not the ground, but the wax or a uh, piece of the flower onto the bee, onto a location that the bee can't get her off. So these, they, like I said, from three seconds, they can go from the, from the wax to on the bee. And so they can transfer very quickly. They're very nimble and agile, much more so than I would have ever guessed based on how they are shaped and how they look. So keep that in mind. They can move readily. And that, that's one of our biggest threats is that they, if a colony starts to fail, or then their population starts to get smaller because of these varroa mites, then when that colony starts to be robbed, the varroa mites move onto those robbing bees and in that way can move to other colonies. And that's their biggest threat. 
so they can spread quite rapidly to other colonies in your apiary once robbing begins. All right, well, let's talk about their life cycle. So just a brief um, overview of the honeybee's life cycle. First, honeybee is an egg. She's an egg for three to four days. Then the honeybee is a larva. She's a larva for three or four, three or four days. And then she's capped. And she pupates for, if it's a worker bee, 12 more days, okay? Let's just, we'll just talk as if this is a worker bee. So the queen lays her egg. The mite doesn't move in at that point. The egg grows into a larva, but somewhere around day five, right before capping, see, capping's right here. Right before capping, right around day five, the mite will slip in right here. That's her slipping in. And she will hide in the food that is in the bottom feeding the larva, okay? So she hides in that food. And she has special breathing tubes that she can stick up and breathe while she's underneath the food. All right, then the nurse bee comes around the sixth day and she caps the cell, all right? And the larva, she's a, it's, it's a pre-pupa at this point, it's still a larva technically. And that larva will consume the rest of that food. And then right before she begins to spin her cocoon, the mite will move up out of the food and onto the bee. Then she latches on, it makes a hole in the bee. And then she starts to feed on the bee. And it's important that she makes this hole because every one of her offspring are going to feed from that same site, okay? All right, well, about 60 hours after the cell is capped, she will lay her first egg, okay? Now that first egg is always a male, all right? So she lays the first egg, it's always a male. Now she will lay another egg every 30 hours until that cap, till that bee emerges. So the first egg is laid at 60 hours, after 60 hours after capping, and then another egg is laid every 30 hours until the, the bee emerges. First egg is always male and all the rest are female, okay? Now once the male matures, he will start to mate with his sisters. And so all of these, everything that goes on here is one family. Okay, now once the hive gets heavily infested, more than one mite can move into the cell and that's how they get genetic diversity mixed into this thing, okay? So keep that in mind. Now for the most part, it is a single mite moving in there. But when the, uh, when the infestation gets high enough, more than one mite can move into the cell. And so then the males can intermingle between the two uh, daughter lineages, okay? Now on average, in a medium to high infested, infested hive, you can have up to seven different lineages going on in there. And so um, inbreeding and genetic, um, the deleterious effects of inbreeding are, can, are overcome in this way. All right, so let's keep on going. Every 30 hours she makes another egg and then they mate. They all have to feed from the site that the mother made because they, when they're young, they're too, their chitin is not hard enough for them to be able to puncture the bee. The bee continues to develop. She does her best to become a bee, and then she emerges with the mites riding along with her. Any mites that aren't riding along with her will just crawl out and try to get on another bee, okay? Then uh, they have a special organ called a spermatheca, and that's where they store the sperm. So the only time they're gonna reproduce is under these capped cells, okay? Then they'll try to get on another bee and try to make it into another cell. And uh, on average, they spend about seven days out of the cell, and then they're right back in the cell doing it again. On average, four mites will emerge for every one mite that enters the cell. So if we have one foundress mite enter the cell, she can come out, and so will four of her daughters. The males die in the cell. They do not come out and do not feed on the bee any more than they do when, the, uh, when she's under the capping. Um, but if two foundress mites enter the cell, then eight mites can come out, you know, the two founders that entered and their, their, their four offspring, okay? So you can readily see how, how mites can greatly and quickly proliferate inside the hive, okay? Now you will hear that a brood break is a good way to treat for mites. It is not. Brood break works in uh, naturally nesting colonies, but there's a lot of other um, pieces to that puzzle. And if you don't have all those pieces together, you're not going to control mites with a brood break, okay? And we can discuss that in more detail if we have time or, and if you even have questions about it, okay? Now remember, if you have any questions about the Varroa mites life cycle or the honeybees life cycle, just type them in the chat there and I will, I will get to them once we're done, uh, uh, once we're done, okay? So let's move on and see what else we got. All right, now, well, actually, I'm going to stop right here. And I'm gonna check to see if there's any questions and I'm gonna answer those, then we'll move on to mite monitoring, okay? So I'm gonna stop the share.
And I'm gonna check my chat, see if there's any questions. All right, we got no questions, that's good. All right, but if you have any, any come up later on, feel free to ask, okay? Is everyone, everyone's hearing me good? Okay, got to hear anybody? No big problems there? Excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the screen share and we'll continue discussing uh, Varroa mite monitoring, okay? Here we go. Let's go back to monitoring Varroa mite and make it big, there we go. All right, so monitoring is extremely important. I, I'm a monitoring fiend when it comes to Varroa mites and I want you to monitor also. And so, oops, there we go. Monitoring should occur monthly during the active season. That is the time at which the, uh, the colony is active and growing. You can't monitor in the wintertime and you can't monitor if they don't have capped brood because these monitoring methods that I'm gonna discuss were all based on the fact, that the numbers are based on the fact that many of the mites are under the capping when you are sampling, okay? So remember that none of these sampling techniques are gonna work if you don't have capped brood. And I want you to monitor once a month during the active season, okay? So if, you, if they come out in um, March, start monitoring in March. If they, they, uh, they quit making brood in October in your area, quit monitoring in October, okay? <clears throat> so let's move on. Now uh, we'll discuss two, the two most popular ways of monitoring for mites, and that is the natural mite drop and the various roles. That could be alcohol, ether, sugar, whatever you want to use. Um, the alcohol and the ether will kill the bee, the sugar will not, but it'll make them really mad at you. <laughs> So, but we'll discuss both of those in detail and I'll show you a video on how to do both of those, okay? And the video comes from the course and we'll discuss that when we get there. All right, and remember, monitoring should occur monthly during the active season, okay? Very important that you keep monitoring and then you treat as soon as thresholds are reached. Don't hold off, don't wait, because they can quickly swamp out your colony, okay? So monitor monthly and treat whenever thresholds are reached, even if that means you gotta lose some of your honey crop, okay? And we'll discuss those things later on as, as we go. All right, so let's start with a natural mite drop. That's just a fancy way of saying the sticky board. Sticky board is, you know, it's just a sticky piece of wood, I mean, a piece of corrugated plastic or cardboard that you stick under the hive. And, and then you count the mites that drop off in a 24 hour period. It's no big deal. It's easy. It's, it's the least invasive way. I mean, these don't even know that you're doing it, especially if you have a screen bottom board and you can slip it under the screen. You never have to light a smoker. You never have to um, pull out a frame, nothing. You just slip it in under that sticky board and you can monitor. However, it's, it's, it requires that you, you have a, uh, a sticky, I mean, a, a screen bottom board. You can stick it in the entrance but you know they clog it up with propolis. They put wax down there sometimes, and they themselves will get stuck to it if you stick it in the front. So I don't like to do that, although I have done it in the past. It's best if it's used in conjunction with a sticky board, because then it's you know they never even know you're there. Now the the, uh, the natural mite drop or the sticky board method is more accurate at detecting low and medium infestations, and we'll discuss some of the reasons why that is later on. Well, basically. When you stick it in the sticky board, you are sampling the entire brood nest because the sticky board covers the entire bottom. So anywhere in that brood nest where the mites fall, they're gonna land on that sticky board. You know, so you're sampling the whole, the whole colony area with the sticky board. And that's why it's better at detecting low and medium infestations. You can miss low and medium infestations when you're randomly sampling single frames for the various roles. But we'll talk about that when we get to the roles, okay? All right, so. But like I said, you cannot, um, you cannot use this unless the colony has capped brew, but that's true of all our mite monitoring methods. So make sure your colony has capped brew before you uh, start monitoring for mites. And uh, you got to come back the next day. And that may be a problem for some of you if your colonies are miles and miles away. You do have to come back the next day and pull the sticky board out and count the mites. Now you can leave it in there for up to three days. And then you count the mites and you just divide by three because you, you, know, you, you left it in there for three days. But I wouldn't go, don't go beyond three days because then the, the board gets so full of debris that you, uh, you, it's harder to spot the mites, okay? All right, well, let me, uh, now this is what you do. Now, if you have one to eight frames of bees, you treat if you get 20 mites in a 24 hour period, all right? So if your frame counts, that is the size of your population. If, you're, if your bees cover one to eight frames of your, of your hive, you sample at 20 mites. If they cover nine frames or more, you sample at 40 mites in a 24 hour period. 
Now, if you leave it in there for three days, you just count the mice, divide that by three, and that's the number you go on, okay? Now, uh, I'm gonna leave this up for just a minute so you can take a picture or a screen capture or take whatever notes you want to. Um, so this, is, this is the, this is the uh, treatment thresholds for the natural mite drop or the sticky board, okay? Now, after this, I'm gonna show you a couple of videos on the sticky board method, okay? So I'm gonna stop the screen share, and then we're gonna um, go to uh, the internet and we're gonna look at one of my classes. Let me see. Here we go. All right, so I'm gonna share the internet. I'm gonna share my video sound. All right, so let's go to class. Let's go to UM Online. There you go, pops up on its own. Now this is, uh, this is what my class looks like. If you decide to take the course, <clears throat> I'll tell you how to get to that later on. But this is pretty much what the class looks like. We want to go to natural beekeeping. <clears throat> natural beekeeping is an advanced course. You have to pass the apprentice course where you can take the natural beekeeping course. But let's go how the nest is managed. And we'll scroll down to overall might. There we go. Sticky board monitoring. All right, we're going to watch this video and it's going to discuss sticky boards. Okay. So let's hit play. Fill the screen and I'll be quiet while the video plays. For mite monitoring, we're going to use the sticky board method. It's minimal impact on the colony and that's what we're going for when we're doing this natural beekeeping. The sticky board method is simple. We simply take a sticky piece of corrugated plastic, slip it under our screen bottom board. We leave it in there for 24 hours, remove it, count the mites. If we have 50 mites, we need to treat. Simple as that. In order to prep your sticky board, you're going to need four things. You'll need the board itself. You'll need some petroleum jelly, a hive tool or a spatula, and gloves. Many people will spread the jelly with the spatula, but I find that I can get a much even coat if I use my hands, and I can get it done a whole lot faster if I use my hands. However, I don't want my hands to be oily all day, so I wear the gloves. All you need to do is simply spread a thin coat of petroleum jelly over the entire surface of the sticky board. Many people will tell you that you can use um, PAM, but you can't. It's just not strong enough to keep the mites trapped to the sticky board. So I just reach my hand in there, get a glob of the jelly, spread it thinly over the surface. Once we have our sticky board prepped, it's easy to install it to the colony. After all, we've already installed screen bottom boards. Simply remove the tab, slide in the sticky board. Wait 24 hours and then remove it. After 24 hours, you're gonna remove your sticky board and count the mites. If you get 50 mites in 24 hour period, you will need to treat. Use some natural treatment like thymol or formic acid or oxalic acid. This is a sticky board after 24 hours in a very active colony. This side is what it looked like when it was clean and new. This side it looks like after 24 hours. As you can see, there's a lot of debris. However, the mites clearly stand out. See that deep ruby colored oval? That's a mite. Let's see if we can't find another. And there's one right there. And there's another. There's one way up here too. Here's one way up here. This colony has very few mites, does not need to be treated. After you've counted all your mites, it's simple to clean the sticky board and prepare it for next time. Just take a hive tool, scrape it, and it will remove all the jelly, as well as the debris and the mites. Once it's all cleaned up, it's ready to use again. Please direct any of your questions to the forums. Okay, I'm gonna stop the screen share. We'll go back. Well, I'm gonna stop right now and check if there's any questions. Oops.
No questions, great. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And pick up where we left off. Okay, so again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in, in the chat and I'll get to them as soon as I can. Okay, so you saw that video. Now, you notice in the video, I told the class to treat at 50 mites, but when we're doing natural beekeeping, we're trying to develop a level of tolerance or resistance to varroa mites. And so they have a much higher threshold than the rest of us. Well, I'm a natural beekeeper for my own self. They have much higher tolerance. I mean, a much higher threshold than uh, we teach most beekeepers, okay? So that's why that number was 50, but here I'm teaching you to treat at 40, okay? So it depends on what you want to do. If you have any questions about that, just type them in now and we'll get to it. If you have any questions at all about natural mite drop or um, uh, how it works, just let me know. Now you see on that one, I made the sticky board using um, petroleum jelly. You can just buy sticky boards. They're just a giant piece of sticky cardboard and you just pull the paper off, stick it in the hive. But you see how easy it was to do because I had already had the uh, screen bottom boards installed. Okay, well, we will move on to, let's go to the various roles. Now that the procedure is the same, regardless of uh, what, what you use, by what I mean, whether you use ether, alcohol, or powdered sugar, the, the, the process is, the methodology is the same. So well, I, I just call them the roles, you know, my, you know, the mite roll we do. Now the mite rolls are great for comparing between colonies because that way, you know, uh, it doesn't matter the differences in the colony, the size, the size of the brood nest, the size of the population. Those things can be uh, statistically overcome if you use the various roles for your sample and they're di more difficult to overcome statistically if you use the sticky board. That's why many of the research researchers who are researching various treatments and varroa mites use the roles rather than the sticky board. Although many, many researchers will, it just all depends on the research question that they are asking. But um, because you can compare between colonies, that's why the roles are so popular. However, uh, it's invasive and very time consuming because you have to open the hive, you have to um, shake off uh, a frame of bees, you have to um, kill 250 of them, then you have to count the mice that, that fall off. Um, and because of sample error, it's, it, it can miss low and medium infestations. And by sample error, I mean, um, let's say you got a frame, you got a colony that is as a brood nest that it comprises uh, eight frames. So you have eight frames in your brood nest, four on top, four on the bottom, and you pull out one frame, you shake the bees off and you use that for your roll because that's what the protocol calls for. Um, what if you pulled off the one frame that doesn't have any mites on it because it's a low infestation? You randomly pull out the one frame that no mites were living on. And so your roll is going to show zero, even though your colony has a low infestation. And it, it's less likely in the medium, but it is still likely in the medium that you're going to pull out one, you know, because what if you have eight frames of brood and um, five, four of those frames are covered with, have, have mites on them, but you pull out one of the four that does not have any mites. So you shake that off and you're going to find uh, zero mite count. And you're going to think, oh, I don't have any mites, even though you miss the medium infestation because of sample error. You can get sample error with the rolls. You do not get sample error when you use the sticky board. That's why the sticky boards are a little better at capturing, well, they're much better at capturing low and medium infestations. Um, now here is the uh, treatment thresholds. Four mites, if you get less than four, it's not really a problem, but you should keep, you know, you should really watch this colony, make sure nothing is happening, okay? If you get five to nine, you need to treat immediately, even if that means you gotta take your honey crop off, okay? You know, if it's middle of July, you got a good flow coming in, but you get nine mites when you do a roll. You got you to you address it right then. Don't say, well, I'll wait till this, this, this honey flow is over. You gotta, you're running the risk of losing your colony if you do that. Because remember, as we discussed earlier in the lecture, and they can really quickly go from a medium infestation, which is five to nine, to a high infestation, which is 10 or above. They can do that very quickly. Because remember, one mite enters, that mite comes out and four of our offspring can come out on average, okay? So keep that in mind. I want you to treat as soon as thresholds are reached. Just don't wait till the end of a, of a flow just because you, know, you wanna get that honey. It's better to go ahead and treat. All right, so now uh, I'm gonna show you how to do a mite roll. And I, I, I pretty, went rich, pretty quickly through the, 
the pros and cons, and I got you right here to this treatment threshold. And go ahead and, and screen sample this, I mean, uh, yeah, screenshot this, um, this, this slide here, or take a picture with the camera, or take notes, whatever you want to do, because I'll leave it up for just a moment longer, and I'll even come back to it after the video. But I'm going to show you a video, another video from the course. This is from the journeyman level. Again, it's an advanced uh, class, and you have to pass the apprentice course to get to the journeyman level also. But I'll show you how to do a mic roll and, and a video from that course, all right? So I'm going to stop sharing, and I am going to um, take you back to the internet. So we'll share the internet, and I'll show you a video on how to do a mic roll. Coming right up. First off, this is back at the back in the course, as you can see. We'll go back to a journeyman course. See if I got one up. There you go, journeyman. I'll do. This is our our latest journeyman course. And in a journeyman course, we do mites. We scroll down. And we get to the very the Varroa mite roll. All right. So I'm going to show you this video. I think it's about four or five minutes long. And that will, uh, we still got plenty of time. We got 20 minutes to go on this thing. So we're still doing good on time. So I'm going to start this thing, make it big, and I'll shut up and let you enjoy the video. Welcome back to the University of Montana, Mount Sentinel Apiary. Today I'm going to show you how to sample bees for a mite roll, and then we're going to perform a mite roll. This will help us diagnose the mite levels within our hives. Okay, to do the mite roll, you need four pieces of equipment. First of all, you'll need to cut you a circle the size of a mason jar. This is number eight hardware cloth. It's just big enough for a mite to fall through, but a bee will not fit through. So you cut it the size of your mason jar and then put the ring back on. That way the bees cannot come out, but the mites will. Once you have it on, it pushes it into the lid and it becomes your lid. Next, you will need alcohol. This will kill the bees and kill the mites and make the mites let go of the back of the bees. Finally, you will need something to catch the bees. I like to use an empty feeder. You can, but you can use anything, I mean Tupperware dish, aluminum foil cut out, something that the bees fall into, you can catch the bees. Alright, the first thing you have to do, you have to get in bees from the brood frame. So they have to be bees off of a brood frame. So we'll work our way down to the brood frames. In this hive, the brood frame is on the first story, so we're going to make our way to the first story. What I'm going to do is I'm going to place my feeder inside the hive. That way any bees that spill over will be caught in their hive. So we remove two brood frames and set in our feeder which is empty. Now I'm going to verify that the queen is not on this frame because if she's on there and you shake her in you're going to kill her. You don't want to do that. Alright the queen is not on this frame. All you need is 250 bees to do this analysis. So one frame is more than enough. So I'm going to shake the contents of this whole frame of bees into our empty feeder. Any excess bees fell into their own hive, so everything is good. Now I take those bees that are now in here, shake them down to one side, literally pour them into the mason jar. They will fly right back out, so you got to put that lid on it pretty fast. So this is all the bees you need to do your mite roll. I'm going to put them off to the side, and now I can put this hive back together.
Now that you have your bees, we need to verify we have 250. That's about two fingers worth, depending on the size of your jar. So we have plenty of bees. We knock them down. And unfortunately, this is the only time I'm gonna tell you you have to kill your bees. So pour your alcohol in, enough to cover all of the bees. They die pretty quickly. Slosh it around a little bit. Now you need a plate to catch your mite roll. We're gonna look at this plate to see if there's any mites. So you upturn it, shake it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Any mites that are on these bees are now dislodged and on top of the plate. All we have to do is count the mites on the plate. One, two, There's only two mites in this hive. That is below treatment level, so we're ready for the winter time. So that's how you do a mite roll. Now don't forget to refer to the infestation level chart that I placed at the end of the other video. Okay, that's how you do a mite roll. I'm gonna stop the screen share of the video and we'll go back to our PowerPoint and we'll be right back to the treatment threshold. Scott, it looks like you've got some questions here in chat. Awesome. I'll stop and take those questions. Thank you very much. All right. While I'm answering the questions, I'll have this up so you can take whatever notes you want or you can screen capture. All right. Let me see. Where's my chat? Participants. There we go. Unless I got, I got to stop screen share to get to my questions, but I'll come back to this. Okay. So let's go to my chat. Okay, great. Got two questions. One from Chris. What kind of material is the board? In the video, the board was just corrugated plastic. It came with my screen bottom board, but you can use anything, uh, just a piece of cardboard. It doesn't matter. Um, or a piece of poster board that your kids would make the presentations for school on anything. Uh, anything that's cheap and laying around or like I said you can buy them they're already sticky and they're good to go all right we got a question from boot 2003 I have heard that some breeds of bees are more resistant to mice than others is that true uh, they are bees that have been bred to have hygienic behavior that means they will uncap cells that are infested by mites and so you they are out there and you can get them um, and that, in fact, that is how um, naturally nesting colonies have survived the, uh, the arrival of Varroa into America. They developed this ability to um, uh, uncap cells that are infested with mites and remove the larva or pupa, sorry. All right, this is from April Harden. I'm not very good at identifying the queen yet. Would it be safer doing a powdered sugar roll? It would be safer to do a sticky board if you can't identify the queen. Because even with the powdered sugar roll, you're, you're shaking them pretty bad and you don't want to treat the queen that way if you can help it. So if you don't feel comfortable uh, spotting the queen, just stick with the sticky board. That is the safest and best method for, uh, you know, to avoid any, any harm at all to the queen. All right. Uh, if there's any more questions, go ahead and type them in now. If not, we'll head right back to the next phase of our lecture, which is treatment options. All right. Okay, we'll go back to screen share now and we will return to our PowerPoint. Okay, so here we are back again at our um, thresholds. I trust that by now everyone has the notes they need or have screenshot this, whatever they need to do, and we will move on. Okay, so now let's talk about treatment options. Now there are numerous treatment options out there, but I'm gonna discuss two, uh, thymol based and formic acid based. Okay, because those are the most popular and uh, most effective, in fact. All right, now for a thymol base, you're going to find Apigar, and you can get in a big bucket like this, and it treats, I think, 60 colonies. Or you can get individually wrapped one. You just pull the lid off and stick this whole thing into the hive. It's, it's really quite simple. Um, you just follow instruction. You, it comes with a scoop, and you, it's 50 milligrams, or 50 grams, but 50 grams onto this little sheet. Put the little sheet on top of the, of the brew frames. Then you close the colony back up. You wait 14 days. Uh, once they, uh, they'll remove the medicine by consuming it and that disperses it throughout the brood nest and they will chew up this cardboard paper to get rid of it. You come back 14 days later and uh, if they haven't chewed up the paper, the cardboard, you just 
throw it out and you put another treatment in. But you got to come back 14 days later and apply again. And there are temperature range um, requirements for both of these. I believe a thymol is good for up to 105 degree temperatures, but they got to be a minimum of about 60 degrees. I can't really remember, but it's written on the on both of these uh, applicators when you get them. Okay, so that's how you use thymol. Now let's talk about if there's anything else I need to tell you about thymol. No, I guess that's it. Um, yeah. All right. So now let's move on to formic acid. Formic acid. Oh, one more thing about a thymol. I am sorry. This is very important. You cannot use thymol when you have a honey supers on. Okay. So like I told you earlier, if you reach that threshold and you have a flow going on, you got to take the honey supers off, then put the thymol in. Okay. And then once thymol is done, um, you know, after 14 days, one week after the second application, you open that thing up and they've removed all the medicine. One week after they've removed all the medicine, you can put your honey supers back on. Okay. All right. So oops, I went the wrong way. All right, so here we are. Now let's do formic acid. Formic acid is same general concept. It's the vapors that kill the mites, but don't kill the bee. Um, you're going to want to, again, put them right on top of the brood frames, okay? So you crack open your colony, slip these things in right on top of your brood frames, and then you close the colony right back up, and it does its thing. It, the vapor, you know, you'll hear the bee, the colony ramp up when I mean, it's sound, because, you know, they don't like the vapors any more than the mites do, but the vapors are not at a level they will kill the bees, but they are at a level they will kill the mites. All right, now the good thing about formic acid, this is Mighty Way Crick Strips, that's the name of the brand. The good thing about this um, formic acid is it can be used with honey supers on. So let's say, you know, it's the middle of July, you, you reach that threshold, you got a good honey flow going on, and you, but, you, and you, you, but you want to treat, but you don't want to lose your flow, then you should select to use formic acid. You should select to use Mitoway Quick Strips because they can be used when the honey flow is on. Because there's trace amounts of formic acid in honey anyway. Even if you don't treat, there's trace amounts of formic acid in honey. And studies have shown that when you treat with, form, with mod, mod away quick strips, that trace amounts of, of, of formic acid in the honey does not go up. So they have very little impact. This, this vapor does not make it into the honey at any higher rate than they would naturally. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and I'm going to check to see if there's any questions. So I'm going to stop the screen share. If you have any questions about the two methods of treatment, go ahead and type them in. Yep, Scott, it looks like you do have a question here. Awesome. All right, let's see what we got here. It's from April Harden. I don't you know, wait a second. It's not from April Harden. I've heard of these beer. Okay, it's from Boot 2003 again. I have heard that B, oh wait, no, there's no new question. I'm not very good at that. Yeah, same, old, I've, I've answered all those, looks like. All right, so if you have any questions about the treatment options, go ahead and type them in now. We're getting, well, we're getting to the end of this thing. We've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to go back to screen share and we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Oh, wait, I did the whole thing. Yeah, that's it. Great. All right. So if you have any, um, any questions at all about Varroa mites, about how to monitor uh, the sticky board or the, uh, the, uh, the various roles, or about the two treatments we discussed, or if you want to discuss any other types of treatments, you just go right ahead and type them in, and I will get right at answering. All right, I'm gonna stop the screen share, and I'm gonna open up the chat. There we go. All right, we got Julie. She wants to know, what about formic acid fumigation? How frequently to be effective? You don't fumigate formic acid, you, or you're gonna to want to sublimate oxalic acid, okay? So only use formic acid uh, in the way, in, in those little, it's going to come in like a little, um, well, it's going to come in a little packet, and in that packet is going to be a sponge, and that sponge is going to be full of formic acid. Now, the packet is going to have holes in it so the vapors can get out, so you got to wear protective gear uh, so you don't get any formic acid on your hands, so you, you, you scratch your face, that's it's terrible, I've done that once, boy, it's awful. <laughs> so, uh, keep the formic acid away from me, and you don't want to sublimate it, what you, what you sublimate is oxalic acid, yeah, you sublimate oxalic acid, and you should do that only in a broodless colony, okay? So uh, oxalic acid is only good in the early, early spring before she started laying a lot of eggs, or in late fall when she's done, she being the queen, is done laying eggs. Um, people are going to tell you to treat, you know, anytime they want to, that is not 
true. You only treat when there is no brood in the colony because oxalic acid does not penetrate the cell cappings. And so all the mites that are under the cell cappings are not affected by the treatment. Now, people will try to combat that by saying, well, I will treat in a serial fashion. That is, I will treat, uh, you know, two weeks later, I'll treat again, two weeks later, I'll treat again. So, and, and over those three week, six week of treatment, I will get all the mites. That is a terrible way to treat your colony. It, it, studies have shown that that greatly reduces brood nest size. So, you know, once you do that, it can hinder the brood nest by 37%. So you don't want to use a serial treatment of oxalic acid. I do not care what the manufacturers are telling you. It is, first of all, it's not approved by the EPA. And second of all, it is very hard on your colonies. So oxalic acid sublimation is only to be used, or even the drip method or the spray method, is only to use on a broodless colony in the early, early spring or late in the fall. And because of that, it's a single treatment option. Okay, so it's more preventative than anything else. You can use oxalic acid as a vapor. And that's why, you know, you put it in a little tiny little hot plate and you slip it inside the hive and that hot plate heats up and sublimates, which mean, that just means it turns a solid to a gas by, and it skips the liquid phase. So that's what sublimation means. But I, to be honest with all y'all, I don't care much for sublimation of an acid because it can permanently damage your lungs if you breathe it in. So you've got to be very careful. And not only that, you're, stick, you're sticking a super hot piece of metal into a wooden hive. And so that in itself has another series of issues that you got to worry about. There's also a dribble method for oxalic acid. It's very effective also. And, but it's a little more time consuming. It's a little more invasive than the um, sublimation. That's why it's not so popular. Not only that, but you can do the, the drips without buying any fancy tools. And the uh, manufacturers of the fancy tools definitely would rather you buy the fancy tools. <laughs> And you can also put in a spray bottle and spray your packages before you install them. So there's, there's a lot of options to oxalic acid, but I don't want you to think it's the silver bullet. It's the, only, it's the best treatment. It's the only one we should do. It's, just, it's, it's useful when there's no brood and it's useful for spraying packages. And but, so all I'm doing is giving you tools for your toolbox. You use oxalic acid when there's no brood. You use formic acid when there's a honey flow on and you use ox, I mean, you use thymol when there's a, uh, when there's no honey flow on. So you have different tools, you have different options for different scenarios. All right, let's go. We've got a couple of questions that popped up. All right, do the optimal temperature ranges for various treatments refer to the maximum or average te daytime temperature? Average daytime temperature. If you can get four or five hours in that day that are in the, the temperature range, you're going to be in the clear. They're going to remove, uh, a strong colony is going to remove the, 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 uh, the thymol within 48 hours. They want to get it out of there. You just got to wait that extra time so the colony can recover from having that gas, that vapor inside the colony. All right, spring, okay, spring in Wyoming means cold nights. Would nighttime temperatures below 50 reduce effectiveness of the thymol form, et cetera, even if daytime temperatures are warmer? Yes, uh, as temperature drops, the, the vapor, vaporization drops also. But that's fine because, you know, once temperatures come back up, it'll start to vaporize again, okay? So, you know, you can, that's one of the reasons why there's multiple, um, that's why you, you put more than one in there. And let me see what we've got here. Taking it even the daytime temperature. Yeah. So, but, but what I want you to do is, you know, because a lot can happen. Every situation is different, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to monitor. When they reach a threshold, I want you to treat. And then as soon as that treatment is done, stick a sticky board in there again, just to make sure that your mite treatment was effective, okay? And that will remove any questions you have about well, was my temperature range was real iffy or this or that or okay. All those things, just check again to make sure that you got all those mites, okay? Now, let's see, April has another question. Thanks for all the questions, April. It's really making this thing good. Do you have a preferred treatment method? I've read a few articles on a different treatment option, but haven't been able to decide which is best. Uh, I do have a preferred monitoring method. I prefer the sticky board, you know, because it catches low and medium infestations and because it's zero impact on the hive. Uh, I do prefer... Uh, thymol, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I did a little experiment of my own and found that thymol was a little bit more effective than formic acid. However, like I said earlier, I'm giving you a bunch of tools for your toolbox, right? So if you, if, if, if a honey harvest is important to you and you reach threshold during a good flow, you're going not, you're not really going to want to lose that, that, that harvest, right? And so then, and then even if I prefer thymol, I'm going to choose at that point formic acid or mitoway quick strips, you know, because I want to, 
we'll make the decision that fits my situation. I want you to learn to do that too, okay? So, you know, use this lecture and, and then use it to make the decision to use the appropriate treatment for your situation, okay? All right, let's see, Christy asks, what number of mites on the sticky board in a hive before treatment? When is a queen vulnerable to formic acid? How long after introducing queen before mite treatment? Okay, those are a bunch of good questions. All right, for the first question, what number of mites on a sticky board before treatment? If your population of your colony is eight frames or less, I want you to treat at 20 mites in a 24 hour period. If your population is eight frames, more than eight frames, I want you to treat at 40 mites at a after a 24 hour period. All right, when is the cream vulnerable to formic acid? In theory, she is always vulnerable to formic acid. However, if you follow the treatment prescri prescription, um, you don't have to follow anything. Fortunately, if you use Mitoway Quick Strips, you're very fortunate because they've done all the measuring for you and, and the treatments are in these pre-made little packets. And if you just, you know, if you follow the treatment protocol appropriately, you, you, you have minimal risk to losing your queen, okay? But if you're going to use, if you're concerned about it, you know, after the treatment has run its course, check and see if you have any eggs. If you have eggs, then you know you still have your queen, okay? All right, let's see. Your third question was how long after inducing a queen before mite treatment? Uh, okay, if you introduce a queen, obviously you didn't have any brood, right? Because you didn't have a queen. So you introduce a queen, you have to let her you let her offspring, her brood, get to the capped brood phase before you can even monitor, okay? So wait for brood to reach capped brood phase. It takes about six days for an egg to go, for an egg to go for, from an egg to um, capped brood. So six days, all right? But you want to get, you know, at least a frame, depending on the size of the colony. You're going to want to have quite a bit of capped brood before you even start monitoring. So once you get a good amount of capped brood, um, let's say a, a half of your brood nest is cat brood. Now, I don't mean half of your frames of colony. So if you have a 10 frame colony and there's 10 frames covered in bees, but only the four middle frames are going to be the brood nest, okay? So check that brood nest. If half of those, let's say, by example, you have four frame brood nest. If half of those frames have cat brood, then go ahead and start monitoring and then see if you even reach threshold. If you reach threshold, then you can go ahead and treat. However, if you want to treat prophylactically, that is, if you want to treat to make, you know, just, it's, it's the time of year to treat, so I'm going to treat. You know, many people just treat to be treating. They don't really monitor like I'm telling you to. They just treat in the fall, they treat in the spring, they treat in the fall, they treat in the spring. I don't really care much for that. I like to only treat when I need to. I like to only treat the colonies that I need to treat. But I completely understand if some of you sideliners and commercial beekeepers, you, don't, you have too many colonies to monitor like that. So I totally understand that you need to treat in the fall and treat in the spring. And so what you want to do is I, I assume you're wondering, okay, I'm going to treat without monitoring because I treat in the fall and I treat in the spring. And so I'm going to, but I need to put a new queen into this colony. When can I do that without running the risk? So what I'd recommend doing there is if you don't have a queen, you don't have any brood, use the oxalic acid method on that colony. Okay. All right. So remember, because I want you to take, um, take these various tools that I'm giving you and apply them to your unique situation. Okay. All right. Well, we're all at the end of our time. I don't see any more questions, so I think we're gonna wrap it up. If you are interested in taking my course and getting more education like these two lectures, you can go to umt.edu forward slash B, that is B-E-E, -E, and you will see my course. If you'll bear with me for just a moment, I will take you to the course. Let's go back here, I will screen share. All right, so like I said, if you want to see, if you want to get information on my course, you go to umt dot edu forward slash b e e hit enter and it'll pop right up just like this and this shows all upcoming courses it gives you a brief description of all the three levels we also have a natural beekeeping course as well and but i recommend getting on the mailing list because these things um these things fill up pretty fast and if you're on the mailing list you get notification before everyone else all right we got one more question while i was jabbering and advertising my course let's see do you recommend treating efb at this time of year during a honey flow uh you're talking about european fly, foul brood i take it um the unfortunately the treatments for the foul broods are the same which is tetracycline or tylosin and to get both of those you need a veterinarian prescription okay and um, 
but you won't get that unless you that you can show the, the vet that you have an infestation. Oh, you have a TM. Uh, I have TM. Then you're definitely gonna want to treat before the honey flow. You have to. You can't treat any antibiotic into an item that's going to end up in in human food system uh, while you know while they're collecting that food. So you have to treat before the honey flow is on. Every hive in the apiary. <laughs> that depends. I don't. I, you know. I. Well, if you already got your veterinary prescription. Um, and you want to you want to do prophylactic treatments, then you should treat every every colony in the apiary. I like I said earlier, I only like to treat the colonies that are showing an infestation, regardless of what that infestation is. If it's uh, Nosema, Varroa, or the foul broods, only one hive is showing symptoms and tested positive. Uh, and you, if you're sure you've had no robbing and you're sure you were sanitize your equipment, like your hive tool when you move from hive to hive, and if, there's a lot of ifs here, if you didn't move any of the frames from that colony to any other colonies in your apiary, it's safe just to treat that colony. However, if you're concerned, <laughs> if you're concerned about any of the ifs that I said, then you should treat them all just to be sure. But then just check them, okay? Uh, because I don't want you to feel like you got to treat them for the rest of their lives. I want you to check them closely and, and see if that treatment has, has suppressed the illness in that one colony and prevented the spread to others. Okay, that is all my time. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I hope to see you in my courses, but if not, I, I lecture off and on uh, for Miss Wishner anytime she asks me to, and I'm sure I will come back to this thing again. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you. Yep. Ma'am? Yes, Scott. Love okay. to have you back. Just not sure when. And, and more questions keep popping up into, um, okay, so any more Zoom meetings or trainings? I don't have anything planned in the immediate future just because it's, it's getting hot out my yeah. part of the world and people are doing other things in the evenings. So I'll probably pick them up again a little bit later in the summer. And then just a lot of, uh, a lot of people here thanking you, Scott. And again, you know, wonderful information, great Thank presentation. And, you know, really like the way you put your information forward to us. It's an excellent Thank way you. to learn. Yeah, it was great questions too. Thank you all so much for paying attention, asking a good question. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to see you all later, sounds like. I'll be glad to do another one of these, Ms. Wister. You just let me know when and you pick a topic and we'll just have another fun time, won't we? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, everybody Goodbye, have a good evening. We'll stop Thank the shit here. All right.